Um, we'll start with a, an opening prayer. Loving and forgiving God, we come before you with repentant and thankful hearts. We know that we are like your disciple, Simon Peter, both flawed and faithful. Forgive us for the times we turn away from you and the times we deny you, the times we fail to serve others in your name. Thank you for your never-ending love and your grace-filled forgiveness. We look to you for courage and strength, for guidance and direction, as we continue to be your faithful yet flawed disciples. Amen. Scott. Um, the video and everything jumps from the Transfiguration to um, the Last Supper and, and Holy Weekend. Um, what seemed to be missing to me was what happened after the Transfiguration, what happened after the Transfiguration and the uh, Well, we don't hear Jen, I'm sorry, I muted, I muted everybody. Hang on, give me a minute. It's now, it's not, there it goes. Um, I muted you. I muted everybody because I was about ready to say something and then you jumped in. So go ahead, Jen, say what you wanted to say. Well, we're missing Palm Sunday. We're missing Palm Sunday, but we're also, what I was looking for specifically was, is Simon Peter mentioned anywhere after the transfiguration and before the, um, the uh, Last Supper activity? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Good try, Michael. Okay, so uh, if anybody has their Bible and want to follow along with me, great. Go to Matthew 17, um, 24. I was looking at Mark. Okay, Mark, and I couldn't find anything in Mark. Uh, after, after uh, at Matthew 17, 24, after Jesus and his disciples arrived at Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. Then Peter came into the house and Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own or sons or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the son, sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. So I thought that was kind of interesting to find that. Um, I did a manual search. Somebody who's more sophisticated probably could do a computer search and find more. But the next one I found was in Matthew 18, 21. It is, it's titled The Parable of the Unmerciful Servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And then there's a long response after this, but this is seven. Remember the seven times seven? Um, passage. We've had that not too long ago, it seems to me, in, in a sermon or somewhere. Um, but in any case, I won't, I won't read that whole section. But the, um, the next one I found was over in Luke. Luke 12, 41. This was as part of the parable of, of watchfulness. Uh, I'll just read the beginning line of it. Be dressed 
Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a, the wedding banquet. So when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. And it goes on from that. Peter asks, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? <laughs> Peter, <laughs> uh, Lord answers, who then is the faithful and wise manager? And he goes on to explain about that. So that, that was just a little clip that has Peter's name in it. And the next one I found also is in Luke. And it, it, it's the lead in to what we're, um, what we're going to talk about for the rest of the session. That's Luke 22. Um, and leading into the Last Supper. Then came the day of the unleavened bread of which the Passover lamb had to, had to be sacrificed. Jesus asked Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. And he goes on about how to how to find where to go. So those are the places I found that Peter's mentioned. Remember the we, beginning we heard from um, from Adam saying that Peter is uh, mentioned many more times than any of the other disciples um, in the in the Bible um, by name. So um, I thought it was interesting to find find at least where Peter was mentioned before we get into the the Holy Week activities. Any thoughts before I move on? Anybody else find another passage I might have missed? Okay, if you find one later, let me know. We're, we're going to, um, I'm going to move into the video. So you can pay attention to the video or you can look up Simon Peter, whichever you prefer. <laughs> Okay, everybody should see the video now. If you don't see the video, give me a thumbs down or give me a thumbs up if you do see the video. Today, we're traveling to Jerusalem and there we'll remember the events of the final hours of Jesus' life from the Last Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane and finally to the high priest's house where Peter denies knowing Jesus. Here we'll see in Peter's story a bit of our own story. So let's go to Jerusalem. So we've come to one of the locations where people remember the events that took place in the Last Supper, the upper room. There are several different locations that uh, Christians have identified as possibilities for this. None of the buildings exist to this day, of course, but, uh, but the place we're about to go into is um, most, where most people come to remember the Last Supper. So let's go to the upper room, probably built in the 1100s, maybe as late as the 1300s, and let's remember what happened when Jesus met with his disciples for the Last Supper. Let's go inside. <laughs> So this is one possible location for the upper room. Jesus gathered with his disciples and he transformed the Passover Seder meal into Holy Communion or the Eucharist. And uh, breaking the bread, he said, this is my body, taking the cup, this is my blood of the new covenant. And this was his way of expressing both uh, the covenant he was making uh, with us and his saving work. And he gives them three commandments that night. We call this Monday, Thursday, three mandates. Love one another, serve one another, and remember me. After the supper was over, Jesus turned to Simon Peter in particular, and he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has, has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. And then he says, uh, I pray that you wouldn't falter. But he implies that Simon would falter. He says, and, and then when you turn back, he says, strengthen your brothers. Simon Peter says, Lord, I would go anywhere with you. I would go to prison with you. I would die for you. And, and Jesus turns to him and says, Simon, tonight before the cock crows, you'll deny knowing me three times. So we remember that part of the story in this place and so much more in the upper room. But I want to take you to one of the other locations for the upper room, and we're going to remember the rest of the story there. So let's go. So 
I'm excited to come here. This is the St. Mark's Convent and Church. It's the location, the Syrian Orthodox Church believes, the location of the upper room. It was uh, first St. Mark's house and his mother's house, and it was there that the scripture tells us in the book of Acts that the early church gathered. It's thought that that, that it was in their home that uh, they came, the disciples came for the experience of the Last Supper at the upper room, and uh, where the early Christians met on the day of Pentecost. And so I want you to have a chance to see this place. I've never seen it myself, so I'm kind of excited to see it. And we're going to remember one more episode from the Last Supper. Let's go inside. Syriac Orthodox Church believes this is the actual location of the upper room. This church built on top of it. I want to take you downstairs where we'll remember one more story from the Last Supper, the story captured in the painting behind me of the washing of the disciples' feet. Let's go downstairs and remember this story. So we've come to the lower level of the Church of the Virgin Mary at St. Mark's Convent in Jerusalem, and this room once went far beyond this wall. There's another part of the room beyond this wall. It is believed by the Syrian Orthodox Church that this is actually the upper room. I want to remind you, we've uh, considered the story of the Last Supper at, at the alternative site for the upper room. I want to remind you here of a second story. Jesus is, has just finished serving the uh, supper, the meal, and he hears the disciples arguing with one another. What are they arguing about? Which one of us is the greatest? They still don't understand after the Last Supper that Jesus is going to die the next day. Which one of us is the greatest? After three years with Jesus in public ministry, they still don't understand which one of us is the greatest. And so Jesus says this, listen, the kings of this earth lord it over their subjects, but it's not going to be that way with you. The truly great among you will be your servants. In John's gospel, he illustrates this in a profound way. Uh, as you may recall, there was water that was used to wash people's feet at, uh, as they entered into a house. They took off their shoes, they washed their feet. The disciples entered this room, the upper room. There was a basin of water there and a towel. No one washed their feet. Why? I think it was because each one thought, if I stop and wash my feet, Jesus is going to expect me to wash one of my brother's feet. And they wanted no part of that. And so each one walked past the basin. Jesus gets up from the table. Remember, they're debating which one's the greatest. No one wants to be the servant. Jesus gets up from the table. And he goes and he picks up the basin of water. And he brings it to the disciples. And one by one, he begins to wash their feet. He takes the water washing their feet. They're horrified. I mean, this is not the way it should be. Jesus is our master and he's washing our feet, but no one says a word until Jesus comes to Simon Peter. And Simon Peter speaks up and he says, no, Lord, you will not wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And so Simon Peter says, well, then my head and my hands too, Lord. And Jesus says, no, your feet, that's enough. And then when he's finished washing each of the disciples' feet, Peter's and the other disciples' feet, Jesus turns to them and says, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me your master. You call me your teacher and your master. And that is what I am. And I have washed your feet. I played the role of the servant to wash your feet. If I have washed your feet, how much more should you, should you wash one another's feet? And in this moment, he's teaching them something profound. Just before that story, John says he now showed them the full extent of his love by serving them. And of course, this was just a picture of what he'd do on the cross the next day as he would serve the human race by laying down his life for them. And what he calls us to be and to do which is precisely what Peter finally understood after the crucifixion and the resurrection. After the supper was over, Jesus led the disciples through the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's go there now. So this is the grove of olive trees called the Garden of Gethsemane. You'll notice that some of the trees are very, very old. Some believe they're as old as 2,000 years. And Jesus brought his disciples here, had some of them remain in a vicinity around here, and he took Peter, James, and John further into the garden. And then from there, he said, you stay and wait and pray here. And he went a stone's throw beyond that to where the church or the Basilica of Christ's Agony, the Church of All Nations is. We're going to go inside there. And take a look but i wanted you to see this beautiful grove of olive trees and imagine the events happening here where the disciples are praying in this garden where jesus has come to agonize before he's arrested let's go inside the church mm -hmm. 
It's architecturally designed so that you feel like you're walking into the event that this building commemorates. You're walking into the Garden of Gethsemane, literally in that place, and you are commemorating, you're remembering and really stepping back 2,000 years in time to that night. If you look up into the ceiling, uh, you'll see the columns or trees and they branch out in the branches in the ceiling. You'll see the stars that are there from that night, so you're going back to that night. you'll notice that the church is built on this rock outcropping. So throughout the room, you can see in the foundations, you can see the rock here and here. And of course, on every side, this church was built on top of this holy shrine. So the rock itself, the place where Jesus came to pray, the traditional location of that is the holy site, the place where once more in his agony, Christ prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. Let's go back outside to the garden. And let's remember what happened when Jesus prayed three times here and three times returned to the garden. So Jesus returns from the place where he was praying, and he finds Peter, along with James and John, fast asleep. He wakens him and says, couldn't you wait with me for one hour, keeping watch? He goes to pray again. He comes back once more, and he finds them asleep. One more time, he goes back to pray. He comes back from his, uh, his prayer of agony, and he finds them asleep. And he says to them this. So we find Peter sleeping three times here in this garden. But Jesus shows grace once more. He says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I realize that your heart wants to be awake and I understand you're very tired. And at that moment, at that moment, Judas Iscariot comes with a guard. He kisses Jesus, betraying him with a kiss. Uh, Simon Peter, what does he do? He takes out his sword and, he, and he's ready to fight. And he slashes the ear of the high priest servant. And as he slashes the ear of the high priest servant, Jesus stops and says, listen, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. You've heard this phrase before. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And Jesus then takes the man's ear and heals him. And, and at that, the disciples flee. They, they leave in terror. Peter starts to fight. And then at that moment, he runs away in fear. I want you to recognize something once more about Peter. Uh, he falls asleep, and yet Jesus shows him grace. Three times he falls asleep, Jesus shows him grace. I want you to notice that he's the only one who took out a sword to fight. None of the others did. Peter took, takes out a sword to fight. But once Jesus says, no, we're not going to fight, Peter, along with the other disciples, all flee. They all desert Jesus, just as Jesus had foretold. Now, as Jesus is arrested, the guard takes him to the Kidron Valley, through the Kidron Valley, to the high priest's house. Let's walk through the Kidron Valley together now. Let's go. So we've come through the Kidron Valley, Jesus arrested, being taken in chains, uh, to the house of the high priest, where the Sanhedrin will gather for the trial by night. It's in the middle of the night, midnight, one o'clock in the morning. The disciples have fled, except Peter and John, who are following in the darkness at the dis in the distance, following Jesus as he's going to the place of his trial. When I come through this in the Kidron Valley, I, I love these tombs that are here in the background. These are very ancient tombs. And in my mind, of course, people have been buried here on the Mount of Olives for a very long time. As those tombs were there, I imagine Jesus walking through here. And in my mind, I think the one who is the resurrection and the life is walking through this place. I wonder if the bones weren't rattling inside those tombs when Christ walked through here. As he ascends these stairs and makes his way for his trial before Caiaphas and the Jewish ruling council. Let's continue on our way. Christians come to these steps when they're retracing the journey of Jesus in the last 24 hours of his life. These steps are believed to be from the Roman period, from the time of Christ. And you can see them going on downhill and on to the Kidron Valley. So this would have been the path that was taken from the Kidron Valley to the high priest's house, Caiaphas's house, where Jesus was brought by trial that night to be tried before the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. Christians will often take off their shoes and walk barefoot on these steps, imagining that they are actually touching the stones that Jesus himself walked on that terrible night. But it wasn't, of course, only Jesus who walked on these steps. Simon Peter and John were hiding in the distance. They were following from a distance, and they too walked up these steps. And it's Peter's journey here at this site that Christians remember. We're standing on the grounds 
of the Church of St. Peter in Galicantu, the Church of St. Peter and the Cock Crowing. And I want to explore this church together with you and show you a little bit of what's here and then to remember the story of Peter's greatest failure. It happened right here. First, however, I want to pause and pray as I'm walking up these steps, just silently, and remember that Christ also walked these steps and that like Peter, I often follow poorly in Christ's footsteps. So this building is built on an ancient archeological site believed to be the hall where the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin met that night when Christ was sentenced to die and also an ancient prison. And the sanctuary tells the story of the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. Let's take a look. So this uh, large hall, you can still see the original foundation stones or really the stones around which this building was built. is thought to be perhaps the gathering place of the Sanhedrin where Jesus was uh, put on trial and where he was sentenced to die. Just outside of this room is the courtyard where Simon Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. And so I, I think it's a great opportunity to look and just imagine the story when I bring people here. What's interesting is there is an opening in the floor here. So uh, what looks like an old well, but as you approach it, you can see the hole goes all the way down into the pit in the bowels of the building. And underneath this section of the building, you find what appears to be an ancient prison, a place where prisoners were kept and shackled. And then beneath that, even still, is a pit, what might have been an ancient cistern, uh, probably an ancient cistern, but which was used as a prison. And, and what happened was, uh, in the ancient world, often uh, these kind of openings, these kind of cisterns would be used as prisons when they were dry. And the prisoner would have ropes put around his chest and lowered down into the pit and then raised back up. So pilgrims come down here into the pit. These steps, of course, weren't here in the first century. But uh, you come down here and typically large groups gathering in here. And I've sat in the darkness sometimes in this room and I've pondered the words that Jesus might have been thinking as he was hearing the Sanhedrin debating his fate above. I always pause, I invite people to just pause and remember as they're here, the life experiences that we have when we're in the pit and we feel like life is hopeless. We've come down to the place where the church remembers, where Christians remember the moment of Peter's greatest failure. It was here in the courtyard of the high priest's house while Jesus was on trial and being sentenced or about to be sentenced to death that Simon Peter, warming himself by the fire, is asked by a stranger who's standing there, you were one of Jesus' disciples too, weren't you? And he cries out, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the man. A second time, someone comes to him and says, no, no, you were one of his disciples. We know you were. And he says, I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about. A third time, someone comes to him and says, no, we know you were one of Jesus' disciples. And he begins to curse and swear and says, I never knew the man. And at that moment, the cock crows. And one gospel tells us that Jesus' eyes, that Jesus looked through the opening, maybe the entrance to the high priest's house to the courtyard, and his eyes met Peter's gaze, and Peter begins to weep unconsolably. Now, when the gospels were written, Simon Peter had already died. He was the hero of the church. He was the rock upon which the church was built, the leading apostle. How is it that all four of the gospels would tell the story? They, they don't want to embarrass Simon Peter. Nobody would do that. So why is this story recorded in all, four, in all four Gospels? Why is it that across the church, everyone knew the story? If it's not for the fact that Simon Peter must have told the story over and over and over again. Wherever he preached, he would have told the story. I denied the Lord. On the night that he was sentenced to die, I denied him three times. And yet he took me back. And if he took me back, he can take you back. And, and, and continue to work through you and use you and use even your weakness as a testimony to his grace and mercy. This moment of Peter's greatest failure became the testimony that he gave across the world, I believe, to God's grace and mercy. And in it, it helped ordinary Christians who also would deny Jesus again and again and again to find hope. Each of us deny the Lord by, in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, by what we've done and by what we've left undone. And if there was hope for Simon Peter, there's hope for us as well. You may have denied the Lord. His grace is sufficient for you, and he will use you. And even the testimony about the moments of your weakness to help others understand who he is 
and the magnificence of his grace. Let's pray. Lord, you know how like Peter, we often fail to understand. Sometimes we fall asleep when you need us to stay awake. And at moments by our words or our actions, we deny even knowing you. Please forgive us, Lord, right now. Make us clean and new once more and help us to faithfully walk with you. In your holy name, amen. amen. Okay, I just need to uh, move things around here so I can get to the right place on my screen to be able to uh, stop that share. Okay. Um, so those of you who've been to the Holy Land and perhaps have seen this uh, this church or walked those steps, um, any thoughts you want to share? Okay. Um, any thoughts about Jen? Did you have something? I was going to say, I do remember looking down into the pit when we're at uh, the high priest's house or near there. It's just, it really gets to you to think that that's what they did with prisoners and that's how awful it was for Jesus. That's what I remember as well. Um, just a pit. <laughs> but going back to the beginning of the video in the church there, I remember that experience too. Um, putting hands on the rock and praying. Uh, do you think it makes a difference to anybody about um, where the upper room was exactly? Does, does, it, does it hurt the story that there's two different places, just like there may be two different places of where the uh, crucifixion took place or two different places where he might have been buried? <laughs> How much do you think that really bothers the story? Anybody? I don't think so. But how about the idea of just being able to see the, the general areas and the, the, not only the topography, but just the distances between places and, and all that? You know, when you walk from the Garden of Gethsemane and down off the Mount of Olives over to like where the Ca Caiaphas house was, when you walk through the old um, part of Jerusalem, you just know that Jesus walked there too at some point. It's just, it's just a feeling that um, it's just amazing. Okay, um, let's move on to the um, to Matthew twenty six. And looking specifically um, at um, the lead into chapter to, uh, to verse thirty-one, uh, just before that is is um, is what we remember as part of the is the Last Supper about um, take the take this uh, take and eat this is my body and then take and drink this is my, this is uh, my blood. Um, then after that, it says, after they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, which I never, never uh, particularly had, had paid attention to that line, because the next line talks about Jesus predicting Peter's denial. So it doesn't, I thought that was all done in the room. I don't know if anybody else had that same uh, idea or not, but um when uh, then it says, then Jesus told them, this very night you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if I fall away on account of you, I will never, he, oh, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And that's when Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, you would disown me three times. And that's when Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. 
And then after that, all the disciples said the same. So, um, some thoughts about that? The quote that uh, is in that passage, uh, I will strike out, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Where did that come from, everybody? There's a footnote. There's a footnote in the Bible. If you happen to have your Bible open, it'll tell you. Um, it's it's Zechariah 13:7. Um, I don't know whether anybody else had a chance to read that or not, but uh, uh, it was a very interesting passage. Uh, I won't take time to read it all now, but I, I reference you back to that when you get a chance to read that that section um, of Zechariah uh, chapter 13. Uh, So this was this was um, Jesus again fulfilling one of the prophecies. It was um, that when the when the shepherd when the shepherd um, is um, attacked, if you will, or when the shepherd is taken away, the sheep will scatter. Uh, and what happened when they came and arrested Jesus? What happened? All of them that were around, they scattered, went into hiding. Um, except we, except we know that two followed, right? And we know that both uh, Peter and John, from their individual writings and and from what we read from the other writers, um, followed at a distance. And interesting enough, it was uh, the only Peter that's mentioned as far as uh, being accused of being a follower of Jesus. Either John was so young. That nobody thought he was <laughs> would have been a, one of the disciples, or uh, or he stayed further in the shadows. I don't know. So I was looking to see uh, whether I could find. I've, I've been finding a lot of interesting art, as you know, is um, with these um, all this part this part of the story of of Jesus and and um, Simon Peter and others. Uh, there is a lot of artwork out there. Um, I did find. Uh, a whole series of pictures and let me uh let me go to my screen share here for a second and show you some of the pictures i found so there's not just one picture of <laughs> peter's denial of jesus there was uh, dozens and there's a particularly um, noteworthy one which was um, which is this one which is um, Michelangelo's picture and let's see we're, we're running a little bit short of time I have a video I was going to play but it takes three or four minutes I'm not going to take our time to do that right now um, do a search when you have a chance um, for the uh, the YouTube denial of uh, St. Peter. I'll just start the beginning of this and you can you can see what it looks like. Um, it was quite interesting. The denial of St. Peter is a testament to the technical and interpretive ingenuity of its creator. Michelangelo Maurice Caravaggio was one of the founding fathers of the artistic style now known as the Baroque. Artists of this period produced strikingly realistic pieces in an effort to elicit an emotional response from their audience. The denial of St. Peter demonstrates Caravaggio's ability to convey the psychological intensity in a compact scene marked by a dramatic interplay of light and gesture. Okay, so that's a that's a quick clip of that uh, video. I just thought it was really interesting. It, it, I thought the, the lady that does that um, discussion, if you're into art at all, um, was very interesting about the techniques and what was being shown and how um, this, this, you know, 
internationally famous artist um, interpreted uh, the scene. In fact, it, I, I was doing a little reflection. I don't know whether anybody else has or not, but we don't seem to have any portraits that were painted of Jesus when he was uh, in his ministry. Uh, we have plenty of, of artwork that was done years after his death, but uh, mainly, I think, by some of the famous Italian painters, but also many others who've, um, who have captured their, what they think they read in the Bible. Um, most famous, probably um, wrong one, is the, um, the Last Supper painting, uh, where they have, they're all seated at a table. And we know, we know now uh, from all sorts of other discussions we've had that uh, they never sat at table, a table like that. They, they lounged uh, on, on mats with a very low table. So um, it's just interesting that we, we believe things we, we see based on artwork that was done by somebody who didn't necessarily know, but they did what they thought was a, the interpretation. Any, any thoughts on that, guys? Well, I, I think that, um, I think for every generation, we try to have a picture either in our minds and then, of course, uh, of the times of the great artists of the, of the uh, Renaissance, you know, they, they were trying to express Jesus, the disciples, in ways that would speak, I think, to the people of their time. Um, I think if we were to, to look at a... Um, try to understand what Jesus may have really looked like back then, I think you'd need to look at a Palestinian who's living in, in modern-day Israel. I think that's, that would give you a, a clue. Most of our experience of Jesus through pictures is, based through, is done through a Western European lens. Yeah, um, and of course that's what, because um, most, most of these artists, I guess, at the time were Catholic. Um, yes. At that time, so they had whatever the Catholic Church was teaching at the time, as as their background. Most of them weren't necessarily Bible readers, uh, but they were getting information from from the priests or whatever to explain to them what what was all about. There was statues being made. Um, yeah, I think it would be if we could if we had the the wayback machine and could go back to, in time and and. Uh, Take our video cameras with us and our uh, our iPhones or our our um, Androids, and we take pictures of what we saw. Um, it would be quite different than what we're what, what the artists were showing necessarily, or what was in our minds. Can you hear me? Okay, I yes. think yes. I was just going uh, to comment. That's up you want to say. Go ahead. I was going to comment that my my comment would be that. He just absolutely did not look like like an actor or a good looking actor. <laughs> the Bible says that he was he, he was any special person that we would ever give him a second glance. He was just a regular Joe. Barbara, you started to say something. Well, two things. One, um, we relate to things that we're familiar with. We re relate to things that are like us, which has always been part of our problem in terms of accepting everyone or looking at things um, through different lens. And so again, by portraying him to look like everybody that that painting was going out to, um, it makes sense in terms of how we tend to relate to the world. Um, another uh, comment, the other day when we were on Michael's Zoom, I mentioned a book that was um, fiction, but it was based on a, um, a new book, um, new manuscript being found somewhere, you know, hidden away that had supposedly been written in Jesus' time. And a lot of the story focuses around, is it real, is it fake? And that, but in that book, um, one of the things that caused people to be very upset, the book is supposedly written by um, a brother of Jesus. And um, he doesn't portray Jesus as very attractive. Um, 
having um, a very pockmarked face, maybe from illness when you, the, uh, he had a club foot. Um, and there was a huge outrage that this could not be a legitimate book because Jesus had to, Jesus had to have it looked perfect because of who he was, equating appearance with inner qualities. And I thought that was very intriguing because we very often, um, our view of somebody as a person and their inner qualities is intertwined with what we visually see, which is not necessarily a very good representation of who the person is. That, that's, that's very profound. Um, so, yes, and, and like I said, if you want to you ch choose your artist, you'll get a different set of interpretations of what they thought, uh, both the events and, and the activities. Um, going back to that, that uh, the series of pictures, there's all sorts of um, different ideas of what occurred uh, and who, who, was, who was in the picture or who wasn't in the picture. Um, but I think it's interesting to look at it all. And Barbara, we'll, you're right. We all need to keep in mind that, that um, somebody else's interpretation is not necessarily the fact, the, a fact. It's just, it's just an interpretation. And that goes for everything, frankly. The movies in the movies in particular. Yeah, in the movies. Like, we were just, our, own, uh, our own interpretation. Uh, exactly. Everyone's interpretation is colored by their life experiences, uh, where they fit in, um, in time and place. Yeah, we're all biased in some way. So you think about, think about the movies. I was just asking Pat whether she remembered who the name of the... Um, the actor was that played uh, played Jesus in, in one of the movies we not just seen not too long ago, uh, and I don't remember. Um, but in any Max, case, Max von Sydow played Jesus once. Um, yeah, and I, I was saying uh, I know that it, it, Jeffrey is the name that is, hits my head, but I can't remember her last name. But in any case. They don't seem to be um, bad-looking actors. Typically, handsome. they're very they're typically uh, the ha a very handsome uh, actor portraying portraying Jesus. Um, just like we get and typically. Very, go ahead, Barb. I was going to say usually very fair skin and light hair. Yes. Um, I thought I thought it was interesting in um, the recent of. Uh, uh, TV version of Jesus Christ Superstar, the John Legend plays Jesus. Um, that's probably that's probably closer in coloration <laughs> than uh, the handsome actors that we've seen it in other stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I taped that. I haven't actually had time to watch it yet, but I do need to see it. Um, so we're getting we're getting close to uh, our quitting time. There's a couple things I want to mention. Um, there's a lot more we haven't covered. And if you haven't haven't read the book um, chapter, I would suggest you read it, or if you haven't, uh, maybe read it again, or or go to the video of his sermon and see the sermon on this su subject, because there's a lot more information there as well. Um, plus, you'll see a lot of the clips that are in the in the video that we just played, Adam's video. Um, I was searching for some music that might. And I, I searched uh, the hymnal, I searched online for um, any Methodist hymn that might have something to do with the denial, Simon Peter's denial of Jesus. Um, I struck out. I did find, I did find a couple things that weren't uh, in a hymnal. I, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar actually is one of the references. I, I haven't played that section, but I guess there's a piece in Jesus Christ Superstar that talks about Simon's denial. Um, and then, um, I, I did find an original, some original music, um, written, uh, and it said it was, um, the pastor of the, Me the Methodist church that suggested that they write this, um, this piece of music. However, they just had the, they just had the words and then they said, play it to the tune of, of another song, but there was no actual singing of the hymn. So I decided that wouldn't work. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do our closing prayer, and on this morning CBS News, um, Josh Groban was, uh, 
was one of the guests. I didn't get to see the segment, but I did see the, the clip for it. And I just remember my favorite song by Josh Groban, You Raise Me Up. So at the end of this, I'm going to play Josh Groban, You Raise Me Up. And then I found a, um, a, cop, a, um, a, a cover of it by, by a group that was really, I thought, really inspiring. So uh, the end of this, after we, we say goodbye, anybody who wants to stay, you can hear uh, Josh Groban as well as another version of You Raise Me Up. It's Scott, I just wanted to say that my takeaway from this chapter was Adam Hamilton saying that Jesus was the Lord of the second chance. <laughs> I think that's a great takeaway. And, yes. and we all need second chances or thirds or fourths or whatever. We all need... Uh, um, all need to be recognized that uh, we are all striving to uh, emulate Jesus, but uh, very, very poor uh, emulations. And at least most of most of my my part, I'm not sure about anybody else. I won't speak for anybody else, but I know uh, I'm glad there are second chances. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So let us pray. Lord, let me be your servant, serving others. As my guide, let me remember the way you humbly washed your disciples' feet. Grant me the faith and courage, in spite of my failings and denials, to follow you wherever you call me to go. Amen. So um, next week, um, we will cover um, the next chapter, chapter 5, uh, from cowardice to courage. Um, I do want to all. I, I want to continue to remember that um, that the reason that all four gospels talk about um, Simon Peter's denial is that he talked about his denial and then what happened after his denial, um, and Jesus and being forgiven by Jesus. So, um, thank you all. Um, I will now start the uh, music, and like I said, you're welcome to stay on. It'll 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 run for about ten minutes. So uh, judge your time. Also, don't forget, we've got, uh, we've got church. Uh, the nice thing about the church being on tape, <laughs> on a YouTube tape, if you don't start right at 10 o'clock, if you start at 10.05 10 or 10.10, 10, you still get to watch it from the beginning. You aren't walking in the middle of the sermon. So uh, that, won't, I, that won't last. Someday we'll go live again. And you'll have to actually show up at 10 o'clock. But uh, I, for now, I we get to try, see it on I'm, video. I might try something the next time I record a sermon and say, aha, you're coming in early or late. <laughs> well, I don't, nobody can come in early because he doesn't make it. Right, yeah, I mean, yeah enough, come in so late. I'll just it'll have... definitely be late. So you, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just, just, just make a break in my sermon. I'll just make a break in my sermon and I'll look up at the camera and I'll say, Scott, are you just <laughs> not getting to church? <laughs> I, to just say, Scott, I see you have an excuse. You finished Bible study late. <laughs> Along with the rest of your Bible study people. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this has been fun, as usual, and we'll do it again next week. And I'll remind people to uh, cut and paste their link in, because I did check when you, when I put the link into that Breeze message, it gives you a, a whole long link through Breeze, so it, it's not, it doesn't work very well. So, Thank you all. Adios, adios, mi esposa hermosa. <laughs>
you come and sit a while with me? You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong. Thanks, Scott. I, I enjoyed that. Um, yeah. Hope you everybody else did too. So thanks, everybody. We'll uh, see you next week. Have a good one. Everyone. Bye-bye.